Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Conspiracy Farm, where we don't start the conspiracies, we just add the water. And now, your host of the most state-of-the-art, most informed podcast on the interweb, I present to you, Pat Militage and Jeffrey Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for war? Locked and loaded, ladies and gentlemen, once again for another episode, another installment of The Conspiracy Farm. Jeffrey Wilson riding shotgun with my partner in crime, UFC Hall of Famer Pat Militich. How are we doing today, champ? I'm doing great. I'm glad you corralled our guest for today. It's going to be very interesting and someone who is on a very high plane of knowledge and digging into the the deep, dark side of a great many of the uh, factual uh, things uh, that are uh, really going on uh, in the world. A great many of things. But before we jump into that, let's just drop a little nugget to some of our farmers. As always, you can support the farm, ladies and gentlemen. Keep this bad boy firing on all cylinders. We have our Patreon up patreon.com front slash the conspiracy farm mind you the audio version is still up everywhere itunes stitcher soundcloud it's still free don't get your knickers in a bundle ladies and gentlemen but we do ask uh, a small eight dollar subscription to our patreon that gives you access to tcf tv that is the on-camera version of the show and we also are going to be shooting other different video vignettes like today we're going to be heading out doing some long-range shooting blowing stuff up we're going to be blowing some stuff up so that uh that subscription gets you access to all the archived episodes we have up so far and access to all the uh, shows in the future, TCF shows in the future. You got our PayPal. You can go to our PayPal links that are on all the different episodes. And, ladies and gentlemen, the TCF store, the Conspiracy Farm store is up. T-shirts, cups, mugs, socks, aprons. Ball caps. Phone covers, ball caps, you name it. Go to STO. FMA hub stuff hub.com front slash collections front slash the hyphen conspiracy hyphen farm that link will be in this video as well and again we thank all of you guys for any donations any ways to support the farm to keep this bad boy firing on all cylinders and today like we said man this guy I've been a huge fan of his show for quite some time I mean he, he goes I mean the 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 depth of his conversations are significant and quite impressive. From your political to geopolitical, your esoteric, your conspiracy. And I just have one question, Champ, and I have one question for you, Greg Carwood. Where would we be without THC? He's the host of the Higher Side Chats. Greg Carwood, how are we doing today, sir? What's happening? I can't complain. No one wants to hear it anyway. But you know what? <laughs> I always say every day above ground is a good day. And uh, how's, uh, how's the left coast treating you out there, my friend? treating me well of course we pay that sunshine tax but as long as it keeps coming out i guess i can't complain about that too much <laughs> the sunshine tax and in terms of what you said about complaining 90 percent of the people don't want to hear you complain and 10 percent are happy uh, happy that you're unhappy right exactly so just you know i think we call those haters we call those haters right yeah. mr greg carwood man i swear you uh again so very impressed with your uh depth of show subject you know, from, like I said, you, you really cover so many different bases that we are into here on the show and the conspiracy farm. Like I said, from from your, your normal current events, pub, uh, you know, uh, daily topics to like your esoteric going back to ancient knowledge, ancient mysteries, et cetera, et cetera. I'm always curious when I meet somebody like yourself, when did that bug bite you? The history slash kind of conspiracy bug to kind of begin tumbling down the rabbit hole. When did that begin for you? I feel like. Being anti-authority was kind of baked into my DNA. I don't know why. You know, you're so young, you just start rebelling for really no reason. It's just something internal. And from there, I got into punk music, and I used to love guys like George Carlin who were rebels. And then I just start to get a little older. You're know, like, am I just rebelling for the sake of it? Am I just uh, going through those that teenage phase, mm -hmm. you know, and then you start looking around at what authority figures really are doing, what the elite really are doing. You're like, no, there is a reason to hate these people. Like, I'm not wrong. Right. Uh, and then 9-11 hit the senior year, my, uh, my, well, my actually junior year of high school. So that's right in that wheelhouse, too. And then you're like, OK, this isn't abstract anymore. This is like real. There's real world events going on right now. And. That, of course, caused a lot of division amongst the friends that I had. Hmm. Some people were not open to even looking at a documentary like Lo Loose Change, and then others were very open to it. And that's where I started to be like, you know, maybe I am a little bit different because I've known mm -hmm. these guys in kindergarten. Some of them are so emotional that the idea of a false flag documentary exists. And 
I was like kind of thrown off by that actually. It was a real <laughs> kind of wake up moment that, oh, I guess I am one of these people out on the fringe and I'm guessing I'm going to stay there. Greg, do, let me ask you a question. <laughs> I have, I have this, I don't know, perceived notion or theory that, that some of us being awake like we are and some people just, just being blind to us, we, we look at them and go, they, they're just blind, that some people's pineal gland is awake and working and some are calcified and dead. <laughs> I, can't, I can't argue with that, man. I mean, maybe it's the fluoride in the water. Maybe it's the uh, psychedelics I did a little bit early in life. But <laughs> up until now, I mean, I was, a, I was kind of uh, drinking the Kool-Aid of dare, to be honest with you. I know it's not cool. But I didn't really drink or smoke until I was 21. So, and that, of course, is another layer of uh, propaganda undoing. But at that point, I don't know what it was. Maybe uh, my my parents weren't on the city water supply. But <laughs> oh, you guys were on a well around because obviously the fluoride or whatever's out there. It didn't affect me the way it seemed to affect everyone else. So I'm kind of with you on that page. And maybe it's a uh, Maybe it's the pineal gland. Who knows? Maybe it's, uh, you know, I don't know how you feel about the whole big cosmic game we're playing. Some people believe in past life regression. Maybe it's some, or, you know, maybe it's something from a, a previous round of humanity that we experienced that has us coming into this world a little more skeptical. Hard to say. Yeah. I think, I think it just dawned on me also that I was beaten severely with a belt by my father. And I think that's where my re revolting came from. <laughs> Challenging authority at, at all times. And it is so interesting when we see what's going on in the world. It's like uh, we're all seeing the same thing, but the, the different interpretation and the di way different perceptions we're seeing. And we're going to get into it here in a little bit, be it, you know, 9-11 or JFK or anything. You know, you have just diehard believers who are just straight got the Kool-Aid mustache on who just believe the official version of whatever it is just because it's the official version and they're so slaves to authority. I mean, how much, I mean, obviously it's hard to say what, what creates that kind of, um, that, that contrarian thought process in people, but I mean, what, what are your thoughts on just seeing, you know, people like Pat was kind of saying, just going along, not questioning anything? On one hand, obviously we just look at those people and it's so frustrating that they don't see what we see. But on the other hand, it's like that old phrase, ignorance is bliss. I've got friends I've known for a long time that have a very simple life with a very simple job and they're happy i mean it looks like they're happy they sound happy and a part of me is like man i wish yes. i could be happy with a soul-sucking nine to five reality it'd be very simple if i could i wouldn't have to do much you know but i feel like if you're awake to the cog in the wheel lifestyle because that's i think one of the biggest conspiracies there is that we're dumbed down and put through a school system that just trains us to go to work for the man in some factory some where and if you can't get past that i mean what difference does it make if you've noticed chemtrails in the sky you know right, right. What does a lot of these things make if your day-to-day -day life isn't enjoyable so that was one of the first things and i knew i wasn't happy in uh kind of the retail trap i had gotten myself in and there were real scary moments where like my now wife would be like hey uh i love you but I don't know if you're ever going to be happy and I don't know if I can live my life with someone who won't be happy if this like show doesn't work. And I go, well, you're right. I probably won't be. If this show doesn't work, you're probably going to be with a miserable asshole because I can't compartmentalize 40, 50 hours a week and come home and just pretend I'm happy. So, you know, I see both sides of it. Obviously I'm happier to be awake, but man, sometimes it just, you wish you could, uh, kind of fulfill that ignorance is bliss motif because it would just be so much easier. Yeah, I was saying just the just the other day, Greg, that once you open Pandora's box of of all of this knowledge, it, you, you just can't close it back up, can you? That's probably why some people don't want to look at it. That's why they don't want to get into those entry level stages because you're going to have to eventually confront your own life and your own decisions and like, have I been tricked my whole life and now I'm stuck in a midlife crisis is when you're too far down the road to change it. You know, kids in a pile of debt and now you've realized some shit. <laughs> like, good luck. 
Yeah. yeah, and it's it's really it's really kind of scary because we talk about it a lot of times on the show, and I think we all kind of do it to some degree. It's really tough to kind of take the ego out of these kind of conversations because, especially the older you get, the more entrenched you are in your ways and your thought process. And when you you get kind of, for lack of a better term, red pilled, you know, it creates that cognitive dissonance, and you hold on to that confirmation bias so hard because. Man, who who wants to admit they've been lied to for the last, you know, however many, 30, 40 years? But <clears throat> ultimately, that's what it takes, I think, for us to really begin to start understanding that everything is not what it seems. We have been lied to on a, on a great many of levels. And it's really kind of it's it's kind of up to us, man, to stay, start taking responsibility for that. The personal responsibility angle, I think, is something that just needs to constantly be put in people's heads because it's kind of not what we're taught in school. We're not really, we're kind of taught more to be reliant on whatever system we're placed inside of. You know, we just kind of like the the school acts as a parental figure. And then you go to some job and you're going to have a hierarchy there as well. And it's just like, you know, do what you're told and you'll be fine. So personal responsibility over and over again, I think it's so important. And, you know, at every level, because even amongst the woke, we still see this issue where we tear each other down over, let's take 9-11. Like, I just recently interviewed someone, and I interview all kinds of people. It's about getting their perspective without interrupting them too much and just seeing what they think and picking their brain. So many different opinions. There's no, no singular narrative that we're all striving for here. So I interviewed a guy who thinks there were no planes on 9-11, and... He thinks it was CGI and the, pl- and the buildings were taken down through other means. Now, I think the buildings were taken down through other means. And it's just, to me, arbitrary if there were or weren't planes. I mean, it's of limited importance. What's important is you realize it was a false flag. It wasn't presented as it was. And after that, I really don't care too much about if you think it was thermite, mini nukes, you know, a laser weapon. That is kind of of limited importance. And so I get upset when we tear each other down, even when we're all already so far in that we we are on the same page, but then it's like, well, if you think there were planes, you must be an idiot. It's like, well, come on, man. Yeah, I'm yeah. already I'm already halfway here. Like, can't we just have some common ground? And that's why our group gets split off into smaller and smaller subgroups, and we're like crabs in the bucket. I agree. I, I've actually heard other other people who actually we've even had on the show and other kind of venues say that very thing about planes, and it's, it is kind of frustrating, but it also reminds me back to what got me kind of woke, if you will. You know, the Kennedy assassination, it doesn't matter how many shooters there were, how many bullets, what, you know, the caliber of weapon, you know, the who, what, where, when. The real question is the why, and when you start getting into that, that's when, like, you know, what, what Pat just said, that's when the Pandora's box really starts opening when you start getting to the the question of why these things happen. Absolutely. And I mean, it's good to read many books on a subject and get the major interpretations out there. But I guess I just don't plant my flag on one and argue it to the death. I wasn't there, but I know that governments lie. I know there's a strong history of false flags you can look at to see exactly these kinds of situations. So I know what I need to know. And I'm not going to like get religious about it, except the fact that the mainstream story is false. So I like to operate, having done this podcast for now like close to eight years wow. and heard so many opinions, I just try to work with like templates, you know, as opposed to getting real deep into specifically what something was. I mean, that's what I want to hear from my guests. I want to hear their specifics, but it's like, I'm just, I'm pretty open when it comes to those details. We aren't there. We only get these things through the internet or the television. So how sure can you be? Right. Well, we, we also notice it's pretty obvious to, to us, and I'm sure to you, that there are plants inside the alternative media, people who have been placed there to cause dissension and division. The, the, the type of person who seems legit for many, many months or a year or two, and then all of a sudden comes out with outlandish claims about some sort of false flag attack, as you just mentioned, and it completely discredits everything they've said, and, and it's done to undermine the alternative media and the folks that are looking at from that angle. Absolutely there. I would agree 100%. Some people, I mean, obviously the biggest one you would look at, it could possibly be Alex Jones. Everyone yeah. has a different opinion. I think he's 
kind of there to be controlled opposition. And I think that was way more obvious in a pre-internet world. I mean, before the internet was big, go back just a decade, there's really only Alex Jones. Like, well, why is he allowed to exist? I mean, there is a reason. Exactly. Convenient. He does his yelling and screaming kind of thing. So whenever, whenever the view needs to like have the conspiracy opinion on, he's the guy they get. He yells and screams and talks over everybody. And normal people who see that message are like, oh, okay, well, that's not for me. And I think that was kind of the role. And if you want to bring it into what's going on right now, him being censored and deplatformed, I don't know. I mean, I have my opinions about him. So I look at this situation. I'm like, is this some type of thing where it creates self-censorship in the community? They don't have to go after a hundred different conspiracy shows. Because everybody's they afraid. Just the big guy, yeah. Make the, again, a template. You take him down, and he's not even down. I mean, apparently he made way more money just yeah. off the attention. And exactly. Well, it's 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 the same thing of you know in terms of an Elon Musk exploding out of nowhere and getting all the contracts with NASA and all the other stuff. You know, it's there's a reason that guy gets gets the upper hand and gets the contracts. There's there's some favoritism going on, and there's some plants in a lot of different areas. There's there's a reason that. A certain company is landing big weapon shipments. There, the, you know, contracts, you know, a lot of different things in a lot of different realms in this world. To be honest with you, doubt. I mean, the rise of Google, Amazon, and Facebook—that's not organic, yeah. in my opinion. No. I mean, CIA runs basically Google and Amazon. Facebook—they're bringing Mark Zuckerberg into the Bilderberg meeting. So it's like it's all part of the agenda. I mean. But going back to personal responsibility, you have a bunch of people like shaking their fists like children, like put Alex Jones back on Spotify. You don't get to make that decision and no one gives a shit what you want. So, you know, back in the early days of the Internet, if I wanted to go to a website, I went to that website. When I discovered something, I had to type in the URL and, and go and explore that content. I didn't get it curated for me. Right. And now yeah. we're in curation. And guess what? If you want to know what's going on in InfoWars, you're going to have to go there. Sorry, it's not on Feedly and Spotify right. anymore. You're going to have to get out of those mainstream channels and and do a little digging for yourself. I think that's okay. No, yeah, without a doubt, yeah. without a doubt. And even going back to kind of the autonomy that, that CIA, the CIA has on Twitter and Google, I mean, if you were to think about it 20 to 30 years ago, what they would have to do to get the amount of intel on individuals – I mean, the, the manpower and the legwork, that would just be insane. But now, with, through these platforms, people are just volunteering, just yeah, di like, diarrhea of the mouth. I'm taking a shit. I'm going to eat here. I'm being here now. I'm, I'm going to be going here. Well, 20, I mean, it's just they just volunteer this information that creates, and among other things, with our, the ubiquitousness of our phones, creates this huge digital footprint that they can just, just they're monitoring everything and tracking and, everything. And it's like the people on Facebook volunteering to do facial recognition by having, what, what would I look like as a woman? Right. And go to that app and have that, and then they actually post themselves as the opposite sex. And right. they go, "What? What is wrong with you people? What is wrong with you?" Or I mean, and the people just oftentimes just don't see anything wrong with it. Well, I don't care if they're tracking any information on me. I'm not doing anything wrong. Or the or the business up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the other day, the guy holding up a T-shirt said, "I just got chipped." So the, everybody in the company just got a microchip, and you know, just don't see anything wrong with it whatsoever. What are your thoughts on that? You go back to our parents or grandparents' generation and you say, hey, uh, in 2018, the CIA is going to put a bug in everybody's pocket and actually in everybody's home. And, act and in fact, you're going to purchase it at Best Buy. Mm -hmm. We're going to call it Alexa. It's going to be real great. Bingo. <laughs> I mean, they would go nuts. They wouldn't believe that you're going to have a microphone in your pocket that can be backdoored or you're going to pay to – put an Alexa device in your home, that would be insanity to them. But again, yeah, we volunteer it all. And we know that these cabals are kind of run on blackmail. So, you know, you don't think you have anything to hide until they find your GPS locator next to some other person's GPS locator because you slept next to each other at night and you're married to other people. Like your phones go everywhere and people don't think about how much could be extracted from that. So yeah. if you yeah. fault at all anywhere like that, somebody's somebody's got that information. And if you're needed, I mean, or if you just get too rebellious, I think that's really the thing. If you're just living your nine to five life, doing the doing the cog in the wheel thing, they don't care. Go right. ahead. Right. But if you step out of line then it's like, 
okay, well, now we can use this data on you. And, and, and at this point, it doesn't even have to be real data. But well, that's what you know, they say. Data, data is the new oil. You know what I mean? It's so, yeah, like you just said, data is so, so very valuable. And even going back to what you just said, the ubiquitous system of the phones and just Aldous Huxley said it. And I'm not a huge fan of the Huxley brothers, but, you know, there's a video of him saying, you know, we there's going to come a point in time and i think we're here where we're going to demand we're going to enjoy our enslavement we're going to you take my phone which is such a huge chunk of how i'm enslaved and people will have a serious serious problem with that so it's very interesting where we're at right now this weird kind of orwellian world that's like you know we're we're okay being tracked we're okay being you know monitored and and we're asking for it, you know, please let me pay $800 or whatever for the most sophisticated iphone or whatever the means to to monitor me please addicted to it we don't want to think that we are just a series of buttons and levers that can be manipulated but we are and we can and behavioral psychologists have been learning about the human body forever the human mind and how to manipulate it all and at first it was rolled out in the school system now it's rolled out on the smartphone there's already plenty of studies out there that talk about the dopamine release of a oh, yeah. little red notification. I mean, I'm fucking addicted to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. We all are looking at that fucking phone at least 20 times a day, probably way more. I mean, that's on right. a day where I'm conscious of it trying to keep it down. So it's really unfortunate that we are so programmable and that they've <laughs> obviously cracked the code yes. and that people just are completely unaware. I am to the point now, Greg, where October I get a new phone upgrade if I'd like, and I swear to God I want to go to a flip phone. I And I'm the guy that's on 180 flights a year. I've got my United app. I've got everything on my phone. You know, I just download my boarding passes onto my phone, all that sort of stuff. I'm really dependent on this. Dude, I just paid for new phones for my daughters, my 16- and 14-year-olds. They have phones that blow mine completely out of the water, and – I was the one looking at my wife before she left for Verizon going, hey, let's think about some flip phones. Let's go mm -hmm. ahead and start backing off all this stuff. They come back with badass computers in their hip pockets. I'm just shaking my head, buddy. Well, and, and think about it. This is a weird thing about how society is now, especially, I mean, the, your, your daughters, teenagers, they're already in that realm of finding themselves and people are assholes and this and that, and they're, they're making fun of people for this and that. Let, let, let your teenage daughters go into school with a flip phone and watch the clowning begin. You know what I mean? That's just a whole nother layer of, you know, they're, we're trampling people for sales on Black Friday or new iPhones. So it's just like now that's another level of, of shame. If you, have, if you have a phone less than up to standard, you get clowned. Absolutely. You're, you're ostracized. Yeah. And on one hand, you got to look at these nefarious few the planet's puppet masters capstone cabal whatever term you want to use you almost you got to just stand in awe of the planning and the detail and the layers of control you're like well jesus christ you know i i i can't believe you rolled this out to everyone and it has so many checks and balances and that is just a great example that you can't get back to the flip phone you no. can't Get off the cell phone. You will be ostracized. Your kids will. I went to a, a show a few weeks ago, just a concert down the street, but I couldn't print my tickets. They only have them on the cell phone. So a person with a flip phone can't go? Like... There's, it's just, it's kind of crazy. Well, and that, that reminds wow. me of like the book of Revelation. It's, you know, kind of the mark of the beast of sorts where you're not going to be able to do any business, transact or live without your, your digital device of sorts. That's kind of, that's kind of the equivalent of, of our mark of the beast. It seems like. Like the whole Agenda 21 thing and everybody was worried about the RFID chips. And I know you mentioned some companies are chipping people. That's 100%. But it's like I think it's a little arbitrary to be worried, worried about RFID chips now when they're already in our pockets. Why do they have to be under the skin? They're in your pocket and right. you don't ever let that thing out of your sight. Isn't that far enough? I feel like sometimes the elite shoot for the stars and then settle for the moon. Like, all right, well, we got it in their pocket. Let's move on. Right. It's like it's a, a good friend of mine who he's a a big percentage owner of a company that owns, say, for instance, fifty one percent of the cell phone companies in North Africa for the purpose of tracking human beings. And he also owns the company that we'll just say that they own the the systems along borders of nations. So if someone sneaks into a nation. 
They pick up all the info. They suck all the info up off of the cell phone. They instantly know who you are, everything about you. And he said to me, very point blank, he said, look, a lot of these idiots don't even have the money for shoes. They're walking across the border without even having a pair of shoes on, but they've got a cell phone in their pocket, and we know who they are, and we know we know everything about them. It is crazy. I, I, it's, it's, I can't even imagine what 20 years from now is hmm. going to be because the data is obviously being gathered more and more effectively and efficiently, and it's going to start being used against us. And I am, I am a little bit concerned, but at the same time, we knew this was coming. Yes. We shouldn't be that surprised. If if we are going to say we've been woke for so long, like then we should kind of extrapolate where this is going and, and guard ourselves. Yeah. You know, I'm as guilty as anyone about not guarding myself from this stuff, but it's it's dumb not to like when when are you gonna when are you gonna if not now well and it, it, you have to create that happy medium because you know unfortunately like you said or we've said the ubiquitousness of these phones you gotta they're almost a necessary evil of sorts but you know like you said you have to deficit we have to deficit our exposure to this you know creating this digital footprint and you know going into that is something i wanted to mention you know as this technocracy and like you said we've been warned about it from 1984 to brave new world as this technocracy expands we now have something coming up called cryptocurrency that I know you've heard of from Bitcoin or all the other 1,500 plus different, different cryptocurrencies. And I think this is ultimately moving us, in my opinion, moving us potentially towards a cashless society, which then exacerbates what we're talking about, where you can't have anonymous transactions with just cash. Everything is on your phone, like you talked about at your concert and stuff. So what do you think about you know that pushing us even more towards this kind of technological or you know technocracy, if you will, where cash is not even going to be available. 100%. When I first heard about Bitcoin and stuff, I was very excited about it. I had guests maybe five years ago, six years ago, talking about it. And I, I put a little into it, and I was really excited. I was like, oh, my God, you know, maybe this is going to be uh, some kind of way to take down the old banking system or subvert it or get around it. And then as it gains popularity, and then you see like it explode to where everybody knows about it. It's a household name. You're like, oh, okay. Hmm. All right. This is, uh, you, were, you were fucking with me and <laughs> trying to get, because they like to use their opposition. You know, they kind of, I, I think they get off on being so smart and, and devising these plans so well that they can actually use their opposition to usher in something, usher in their own enslavement, basically. And yes. they use the community to usher in crypto everybody's like oh it's gonna you know we know how bad the banking system is let's get around it it's like well this isn't getting around it this yeah. is banking system 2.0 you know and now you have no cash he, exactly and that's why in the introducing the technology of blockchain and you see the federal reserve you see all these companies chase manhattan you know engaging in their own level of blockchain technology and so you know i think as we do move away from cash which i think is there's a certain inevitability of it you know, this notion of decentralization and this is, you know, the Patriots money. I think we need to be careful with that because, you know, if it's electronic and it's digital, somebody has that information. Somebody has access to that information, even though the ledger is supposedly unhackable and all that other good stuff. But, um, yeah, I, I think that it creates it could create some potential problems. But obviously, like a lot of these other digital things, it has its benefits as well. But again, we got to find that happy medium. And it's just a tool, but. <laughs> It's unhackable today, and I think people forget how quickly things move in the tech space. And is the same blockchain going to be unhackable in 2030? Right. I think it's insane to be sure that it can't be hacked. I mean, it's just like we really don't understand it. We watch some videos where that it's explained to us, and we're told it's unhackable, but you can't go to the mat with that, like unless you work on the technology. Yeah, you'll hear so many people who are now like treating it like their new religion. And ev I get it. Everybody wants like some silver bullet to the system. Everybody wants a savior. Everybody wants something to get us out of this enslavement system. But I just don't think it comes from the top down. And when you got something that was made by someone who was anonymous and it kind of just creeps into society, and now it's like a huge money-making opportunity. And I also just interviewed a guy, it hasn't released yet, but Michael Joseph is a dude who looks at the esoteric and symbolic elements of all kinds of interesting things and kind of parses out, 
if it's something that we should be skeptical of. And when you saw all these companies come out last year, once cryptocurrency started making its way into the culture, you saw an explosion of different coins and different ISOs and just companies and exchanges. All their symbolism, for the most part, is, again, blockchain, cryptocurrency. I mean, crypto means a cult. So it's like, why is it all wrapped up in this kind of stuff? Like Steemit uses the Prometheus flame as their logo. The elite think that they, they get into this whole ancient Lucifer rising, Prometheus fire giving type of stuff. The elite have a very strange religion, if you ask me, and they keep it very secret. But when you see these things emerge, like the Prometheus statue at Rockefeller Center, they think they are... In their own warped minds, I believe, they think they're giving us technology, and it is our own enslavement, but they think they're doing a good thing. So when you see these same motifs like Lucifer, like Prometheus, invoked in the symbolism of these crypto exchanges, and it's like, well, what is that about? I mean, cryptocurrency, CC, 33, I mean, is this a Masonic thing? It's all done on cryptography. Well, how did the Knights Templar change banking? Cryptography. Binance is one of the biggest exchanges. They were an Asian, uh, I think Chinese exchange could have been Korean, but once they became the number one exchange, they moved to Malta. Well, why did you move to the island of Malta? That's all wrapped up in the Knights Templar stuff too. So I think there's enough weirdness to look at it and be like, I don't think this is all organic, just coming from some Silicon Valley people who don't have some deep esoteric knowledge. There's clearly something going on here that doesn't feel right. Yeah, and that. You know, now we have to lead into the discussion about AI and how much of AI is writing all of these digital currencies and AI's connection to one another, singularity eventually being reached if it hasn't already, the weaponized, the weaponized robots that are connected also to the same, that same global platform of knowledge. Sophia. Sophia, yes. I mean, you have to say to yourself, at what point, are we allowing the machines to not only, well, have weapons to be able to hunt us on facial recognition, which we've already given them via the Internet over and over and over again. Now are they printing our money? Are they going to control everything? And, and are they going to become smart enough? Have we created a god that is evil and eventually wants to take us out? Skynet, essentially. Yes, I'm very concerned about AI. I mean... You're right about where are we on that timeline? Is it already too late? I, I really don't know. It's all outside of what we experience on a daily basis. But with social media, I've already seen some fairly creepy things. I mean, kind of arbitrary, maybe just glitches in the matrix. But for example, uh, a buddy of mine, a colleague, I was on Twitter and I got a message that he tweeted something at me and it sounded weird. I'm like, I don't think he would tweet that it just doesn't seem like it fits with his character so I screenshotted it and I said hey was this you and he's like no that wasn't me wow. and it wasn't anything seriously terrible it was pretty mundane but it just didn't sound like him so I have a real world example of someone communicating with me through social media and I was told they said something that they did not say well that's so like that that's like alluding to the person Pat was talking about he's told this story before the guy you know could basically call you from another you know from the certain number but actually using another number and he'll it'll be like you know it'll be somebody else yeah or or you know he could send me an email from your from your email address and your IP address would come up and he would send me an email he even I'm just going to say it well I don't know if I should say this on on air but let's put it this way in an arena I watched him start a fight between a promoter and a big name athlete by sending a tweet from one, he just went through, he showed me on his screen of his phone, and he pulled up the cell phone for one individual and then tr scrolled through. Dude, he's got, he can control anybody's cell phone in the arena at the time he wants to. Pulls up the other guy's cell phone, sends a tweet that basically says F you from one guy to the other guy, and he watches them ringside. And you can see these guys starting to go at it back and forth on their phones down on the floor of the arena and he's the guy that's doing this and this is how you know my god uh putin sends trump a friggin uh, a, 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 a text message that says missiles are on their way asshole right. you know obviously that's very extreme to say that but 
that's just an example of how they can really manipulate and mess with people. And not only that, but they can frame you for any crime they want at any time. They can send, have you sending emails out to some cartel member saying, you know, whatever, uh, transfer bank transfers, fake the bank, tra- bank transfers of millions of dollars that you're doing huge drug deals or human trafficking or anything. Something incriminating. Throw anything in there, yes, incriminating, and you're gone. That's scary. I'm not surprised by that. We really have to be careful how much we trust what comes through these screens, whether it's news, whether it's conspiracy forums that we're on. Yeah. I think we can trust that. Or it's even our own friends and family and the communications we're having. Like, I think we should all take take a few steps back and stop relying on social media to facilitate these conversations because we don't need that middleman. And uh, another weird example ties into UFC. I was checking Facebook. I got all these notifications. Like, what's this about? And it's like these people have all commented on your post. I'm like, you know, I haven't posted anything in a few days because I'm kind of I'm pulling back from all that. And I look. And my Facebook account shared that story about Cowboy Cerrone uh, almost dying in a cave. You know, that happened a few days ago or yeah. whatever. He, uh, I like cave stories because I like inner earth, hollow earth stuff, and I watch UFC. So it was weird that there was a story that maybe I would have posted had I seen it. It actually got wow. shared on my page, and I did not do it. And so, you know, I just commented, wow, this is an interesting story, but I got to admit, this is the first time... I'm seeing it, and it says I posted it six hours ago. So I don't know what's going on, but wow. I, <laughs> I I can only imagine how, you know, considering how fresh all this stuff is, what it's going to look like the more and more dependent we get on it. Imagine being a kid today raised on this shit. We all see them. Yeah. At least we have – at least we were past our formative years before this all rolled yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. And the only good thing I see coming of all of this, and you tell me your breakdown on this, Greg – is we know that we've all been surveilled for many years now. Once once cell phones came out, you know, they had tracking. NSA has been watching us. But they never thought that she would lose the election. And have the tables turned on the elites now, the people, the globalists, the elites who have been committing crimes for many, many, many years, are all those electronic files now in the hands of true patriots who are going to expose this? Is it going to happen? But a part of me just thinks that if you're at that level and you can get elected to be president, you're already compromised or they wouldn't have you win the nomination of the party, no matter what it looks like on the surface. Part of me thinks that Hillary went in front of the uh, reptilian cabal and they were like, look, lady, your one job was to be liked and no one fucking likes you. You're <laughs> supposed to be up in space and you fucked up. You went too far and we can't put you in that office because the heat's coming on us. So we're going to take the guy that you thought was going to be the uh, dumb, obvious loser, you know, the opposition that couldn't even get into office. We're actually going to take that guy because I, we can control him, too. And. You know, if I had to guess, that would be what I would say is that they, they do not take chances. The elections are completely controlled, in my opinion, at that level. And I think they maybe did make a pivot. They changed horses right before the race was over. And I think Hillary was surprised. But I don't know. I, I think that we have a tendency to think things are different. Like if you were liberal and when Obama got elected the first time, you were like, oh, my God, he's the Internet candidate. He's talking about, you know, reeling back these wars and closing Guantanamo Bay. Like, oh, my God, we finally got through. And it's because of the Internet, this grassroots movement. Yeah, bullshit. You know, now on the right, side, they've got people who are, are, are conservative thinking that same way. And I think it's just another net to get caught up in. I would wait and see. You know, I'm not I will wait and see. If uh, if pedophile rings are broken up nationwide and all these people from Hollywood and Washington, D.C. are marched into a prison cell, then I'll be like, oh, OK, so that is official. Like that is the timeline that we're in. But I'm doubtful, you know, and I, I definitely I agree with you. And Pat and I kind of have a differing opinion on that. You know, even before Trump was elected, I was just like, there's no way he's going to win. Hillary is way too deep, deep state. 
Trump comes off way too much like a lone gunslinger, you know, white hat is packed, people call it, and they just don't allow that to happen. Like you said, and I've said before, you know, they're not, they're not elected, they're selected. And so, you know, I think, and I guess this kind of leads us down to this question I wanted to ask you about, and you kind of answered it. You had on a gentleman not too long ago, Gordon White, and you guys were talking about the state of the conspiracy movement, almost kind of like what Pat and I talk about. It's been kind of infiltrated, super dumbed down, where we're now talking about flat earth and whether Australian exists, when like real, real shit is taking place. What are your thoughts on, you know, I guess you kind of explained it, but your thoughts on, on Trump, his veracity, if you will, as a white hat uh, Q Anon supposedly being this 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 means by which you know they're dropping the breadcrumbs and, and leading us to this this uh, hammer dropping as everybody said you know perp walks etc. I tend to call that me personally you know coming off Alex Jones and the fear and the SWATs coming to rape you and your daughter this is this moves in the not fear porn this is more hope porn to keep kicking the ball down the road but almost like you said nothing really changes and i use this analogy a lot and i actually need to correct myself because i've been fucking it up every time i say it i always i still always said it's the baptism scene at the end of godfather 2 but it's actually godfather 1 that this scene is in where michael corleone a gangster takes out all the other gangsters to bring in his new brand of gangster and that's kind of what i think trump is and listening to your gentleman your friend gordon white talking about the pivot away from you know the bretton woods petrol dollar moving into kind of a different um, uh, different kind of architecture of global politics. I found that a very, very fascinating uh, analysis because, like, like you just said, I don't think there's any white hats in this scenario. What are your thoughts on you know Trump being supposedly the white hat, QAnon, and you know uh, these perp walks and the storm, et cetera, et cetera? Totally agree with you. It's just if you look at the human story, empire doesn't end. There really isn't an example or a period of time that we know of maybe in previous rounds of humanity the whole Atlantis thing who knows what was going on back then but as far as we know empire doesn't end it changes it morphs the control centers move around from britain to dc and stuff like that but it never ends and so the thought that we got this reality star president who's going to really break down everything i just i think hope porn is a great term I mean, what, like the point I just made about Obama being the hope porn of the left. I mean, exactly, what, what? exactly. Logan, it was hope. So I really just think that the pendulum swings and every time we're like, oh my God, that last guy was so terrible. We got to get this new guy. And people drink that Kool-Aid for a while. Every four and it's years. Getting more sophisticated too. That's the thing is like, you can wake up to it, but then the, it gets more sophisticated. And with this Q thing. I don't know. I mean, I like to say that I have covered all conspiracy topics. And so I've had on Jordan Sather, one of the big Q guys. And I was like, you know, go ahead and make your case. I'm not here to debate you. I'm here to let you make your case for this alternative perspective. And I just think it is hope porn. I, I got to agree with you, man. And in terms, of the, in terms of the timeline, in my mind, the thing that's going to tell us who's right and, and who's wrong is leading up to the midterms, the bombs that are going to be dropped during the midterms, the false flag attacks potentially that could happen, uh, the perp walks potentially that could happen leading up to the, you know, the really the, the full launch of the, the executive, you know, the, the executive movement by Trump, you know, signing that executive action in terms of basically seizing all assets of people who are human traffickers, pedophiles, um, treasonous, seditious, you know, all of that stuff, it's on paper. We know that Guantanamo Bay has been expanded. All those things are factual. And so it just comes down to now, will the trigger be pulled and how will it be pulled leading up to the midterms and then leading up to the presidential in 2020? You mentioned that show with Gordon White. Something that he talks about in this change is the removal of the fulfillment layer, what he calls the fulfillment layer. If you think of a a pyramid, imagine the capstone saying, you know, we don't need levels two, three, four, and five. We have direct access to every person with the Alexis devices, with the computers and the smartphones and Amazon. We really don't need you, Hillary Clinton. Uh, I think there's a possibility that they're removing that layer because it has served its usefulness and the technology has replaced it. So we might see these people get marched out and put in 
camps and go to Guantanamo Bay. It's possible, but I don't think that changes who's at the capstone or the control they have over the masses. It it would be a really interesting dog and pony show, but I still think that the the control structure is there and intact. I, I definitely agree with you. It's, I mean, like I said, and it's been frustrating because I've seen elements of, of kind of Q and it's like some coincidences, like recent John McCain's death, you know, some 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 tweets he, uh, Q made the day before, day two before, you know, I, you know, there's rumors that that McCain was forced to suicide himself. Like there's it's already gone off the chain as far as what happened to John McCain. But, you know, I've, I've just seen some elements of Q. And again, I fall for the whole point, too, because as you know, as Pat knows, we talk about all the time, you know, the, the rabbit hole is so deep. It's so fucking dark. And some of this level of just pure evil. You know, we just talked to Fiona Barnett the other day. I don't know if you're familiar with her. You know, it's a satanic rituals uh, abuse survivor. Her story is just it's just beyond heartbreaking. So it's like the lack of accountability for all these things, false flags, you know, economic collapse. It's just I've been wanting some level of accountability and you just don't see it. So I'm like more than anybody else want Q to be legit. But I almost kind of fall back to that default mode of my deep cynicism. Like you're saying, it's just there's too much at stake here to just allow some white hat lone gunslinger to come in and change the game without adhering to whatever this next phase is, whatever it is, like Gordon White was saying. He had a very interesting analysis. I tell everybody, go check out Higher Side Chats and watch that interview with Gordon White. A very, very interesting analysis on on Trump, um, not necessarily being a white hat, but just changing the next phase of, of geopolitics in 2018. Appreciate that. And I guess to uh, kind of give those cliff notes, he thinks that The situation has been that since World War II, the rest of the world has gotten access to the American consumer at a deal. And, you know, we do pay too much money into the U.N. We we are overextended in all these things. And our economy is a snowball of debt. And so the empire made a pivot, said, we're going to renegotiate all these deals. You're going to pay more. You're going to bitch and moan about it, but you're going to pay more because we have the American consumer, which is the best consumer on the planet because we are their product. We are the empire's product. And I think that's an interesting point. He also thinks, and this is the part that I I really like, is we know, I mean, at least I would think that a lot of conspiracy folks know that zero point energy technology, anti-gravitic crafts, these things have been in the mix, in the deep state, these deep state toys, as Gordon calls them, they've been in existence for generations and they've just been relegated to the back of the warehouse at Lockheed Martin. And he thinks that because the economy has kind of like reached a point where we need to open up a new slice of pie to stay the number one nation, uh, he thinks that possibly the idea of a space force is a precursor to rolling out that technology that's been in the deep corporate and bringing it out in a mainstream way. Because how would you do it? You know, you would have to do it through the government possibly through the military. And if you drag this stuff out of the basement of Lockheed Martin and you put it out to the public as if it was something new, what's Lockheed Martin going to say? Because that stuff wasn't supposed to exist. Right. You're going to say it stolen from you and you've been holding on to it for 50 years? You can't say that. <laughs> so I do think there's a possibility that there is some good with the bad. But I think it's just a renegotiating of terms. You know, a new mobster comes to power and he goes around to all his businesses and says, okay, now I'm in charge. We're changing the deal we had and we're going to renegotiate whether you like it or not. And I think he's been going around being the front man for that renegotiation. And the part that I'm excited about is the potential for these things to be rolled out. But the way Gordon puts it, it's like a pretty fresh and new perspective, but it also keeps intact the fact that empire always is on top and this isn't the great savior that some people think it is but it is something different and I, I like that i thought it was pretty fresh i'm not hearing it very many places right so there's a lot of people out there that are listening to this or will listen to this and and listen to what you just said about anti-gravitational uh vehicles and all this sort of stuff and uh, they're they're not fully comprehending a lot of, of what you're saying i'm sure uh, you've got a very educated crowd and so do we but there are newcomers all the time so basically to simplify it for them and dumb it down for the for the newcomers is that um, hopefully in my lifetime, I'll have an anti-gravitational a BMW sedan in my garage. Absolutely. Little DARPA, fresh issued, anti-grav, <laughs> anti-grav boots. If but you uh, take it back to uh, 
to uh, World War II even. I mean, the Nazis had some really interesting technology. Cutting they had edge. the Nazi bell. Most people should know about that. Yep. Uh, it seemed to be some type of energy device. Yeah. You know, Roswell happened just a few years after the war ended. Some people think that at that moment, the government thought that saying it was aliens was a lot less damaging than saying that, oh, the war isn't over. These people are still out there and they have these advanced crafts. Thomas Townsend Brown is another guy who, a few decades before that, created anti-gravitic crafts and was going around showing them off. Um, people know the Tesla story, that kind of free energy, directed electric current, like, you know, people know those kind of things. And I think the patent system exists so that when someone tries to file a patent for something in this realm, they, they get a visit and they might end up dead or they get absorbed into the deep state system because the secret space program, I think it's pretty vast. I think they've been working on this stuff for a long time. And another detail that's interesting with Tesla that I'm sure some people know, John G. Trump, Donald Trump's goddamn uncle was the one who was an MIT scientist at the time when Tesla died. They confiscated his papers. Yep. John G. Trump you is know. the one who went over all those papers and then came out publicly and, publicly and said, there's nothing to see here. There was nothing useful in it. Okay, I'm sure there wasn't. You know, then just release the papers if there was nothing useful. Yeah, I, you know, they, I found that fascinating too. I just think there are a lot of secret technologies that exist, but because they get in the way of the oil tycoons, they aren't released. I mean, we do know this. When, when uh, cars were first invented, they ran on alcohol as well as gasoline. And then we had prohibition. People think prohibition was about drinking. It wasn't about drinking. No one gave a shit if you drank yourself to death. It was about alcohol as a fuel source. So they made it oh, illegal for that. 10 years. And then now everybody forgets. People can drink again. That's all they care about. So if you look at the history of dismantling electric cars and dismantling cars that run on alternative fuels, it's all about the oil tycoons oh, yeah. and the rubber barons and anything that threatens that marijuana, alcohol for a period of time, uh, electric cars, anti-gravitic crafts, zero point energy. We are not allowed to have that stuff. And it, it very yeah. much exists in my opinion. And it definitely is usually about, you know, like you said, Ford or anybody else protecting their particular fiefdom or William Randolph Hearst as it relates to the paper and, and newspapers, et cetera. You know, going back to what you were saying about secret tech, and I think you had him on your show, Dr. Joseph P. Farrell. That's another guy who goes really, really deep on, on Nazi ancient or Nazi tech and their, you know, their involvement in esoteric stuff, the bell. Um, but moving forward, what you're talking about, the guy, you know, people protecting their tech, you know, the guy, forget his name off the top of my head, but it was the late 80s. Um, and he invented the hydrogen fuel cell and had a car that would pretty much run from New York to California. I forget what it was. I'm just basically nothing. And he wound up having conversations with the water. Pen yeah, it was water. Basically, a car ran on water. And so he wound up getting, um, you know, like you said, a visit from the Pentagon. And there was some technically, I think some some patents or some kind of contracts being being uh, written out. And he was out to dinner, I think, with some Pentagon people or just family. He hopped up from the table, said, they poisoned me. They poisoned me. And they, he ran out in the street and died. And this was, uh, I forget the gentleman's name, but no, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, they, they definitely are going to do what they have to do to protect their particular industries. And anybody who comes along with, you know, like you said, anything that's you know going to threaten that, there's, there's going to be some hell to pay. Before we let you go, my friend, and I can't thank you enough, bro. You've had, again, so many different guests, so many different subjects. And I really, really appreciate your depth of, of knowledge and, you know, your interest in a lot of these subjects. What would you say, I wouldn't even say Mount Rushmore, but what are your top subjects and top interviews that you've had on your show? Yeah, it is a, that is a big question for sure. Hey, with eight uh, years, I know you've been going a long time. but <laughs> Also, just ask the questions, you know, so I don't uh, necessarily own everything the guests say, but Rick Simpson was one of my favorites, the guy who's basically behind Rick Simpson Oil. I mean, it's a, the show is about somewhat about cannabis so like to have someone who's at the forefront of cannabis as a medicine was a pretty big milestone in recent episodes charlotte Izerbeet, she actually worked in the department of education during the reagan administration she's like 87 years young i interviewed her just a few weeks ago which was kind of an honor to have someone who has had such a career i mean she was fired for releasing a document 
that was called about Project Best. It was a classified document. Project Best stood for Better Education Skills Through Technology. So here she is during the Reagan administration saying, wait a second, better education skills through technology, you're basically talking about Pavlovian training, and by making it computer-based, now you're taking the teacher out of the equation. She saw this back then. So, like, the world today, to her, is just a, a real <laughs> mess. And Did she have any, what was her sentiments on Common Core? Oh, I mean, she. I was surprised when she said Common Core wasn't new. They've been talking about it for several decades. But the Joseph Frankfurt Farrell, School. who you mentioned, he also wrote a book about that, too. I mean, it's just another rollout of backwards thinking. I mean, a, a lot of stuff in Common Core, the examples I've seen posted online are like there is no right answer to a simple math question. It's like however you feel. Uh, that's some of the examples I've seen. That's weird. Like, that is... Greg, I've had to do, Greg, I've had to do those math <laughs> those math questions with my daughters, my 16 and 14 year olds, when they were younger, I would send notes back on their math homework, uh, just chewing the teacher out for this garbage. That how dare they do this? I, it, it made no rhyme nor reason. I'm telling you, it was insanity to go through it. My wife, who is a doctor of chiropractic, when she got here to the United States, her first language was French. She barely spoke any English. She had to study to become a doctor of chiropractic in a language she did not understand. So she was smart enough to become a doctor in a language that she did not speak for quite some time. She was smart enough to do that, but she would look at these questions and go, this is nuts. So, you know, the teacher could look at me and go, wait a minute, you fought for a living. You're a moron anyway. But they can't look at someone who learned to become a doctor, studied to become a doctor in a language that wasn't even theirs, was smart enough to do that, and would say the same thing. It, it, was, it was insanity. We are just trained to go for the gold stars, and we do that for our whole life. And another thing that Charlotte Iserbeet said that I thought was really insightful is she talked about the first wake-up moment for her is when her kids were in a public school and they brought home one of those surveys we've all seen, my name is blank, I'm blank years old, my favorite activities are blank, blank, blank. You know, you fill out these questionnaires and back then she was like, this is a little weird. And her kid even commented like, I don't really know if I want to give them all this information about my parents and my friends and family. And this is all like massively pre-internet, like in the 70s. And think about that questionnaire today. It's like data collection. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Figure out how you think and manipulate. Once they have that information, then they can change the way you think. And I would imagine all those things are done at the local public school level. They all get shipped off somewhere to some uh, data collection facility where they actually parse through it all and they see how their agendas are going and then they change them the next round. So I think we are at the end of a long process. I could, shouldn't even say the end, but we are at a pivotal moment in a long process. It's been multi-generations deep and They've got us by the balls now. They've been doing this work since before I was born, being 33. They've been doing this work for a long time. How am I supposed to figure anything out? Right. You know, how is anybody in their 30s who went through the education system, you know, it, it really is kind of insane when I hear people spouting off about they've got all the answers. And it's like, I mean, it's a nice comforting thought. But this machine is very deep and has a lot of practice. And it's, it's gotten to the point in history where doctors, pediatricians are now asking children, do mommy and daddy have guns in the house? That's scary. Wow. Yeah, I guess d information is the new data, or data is, I'm sorry, information is the new data. Data is the new oil, and like you said, they, they can weaponize it and use it in all these different capacities. It's really, really freaking scary. Well, Greg Carwood, I can tell you, man, this has been an absolute blast. I could probably sit and talk to you for quite a while. Like I said, is uh, your, your interest in so many different subjects, and we just kind of scratched the surface. But I definitely want to thank you so much for your time, brother. Any uh, social networking, websites, where can we track you down, brother? I know you got Where can the government and NSA track you down? Yes, yeah, sir. Appreciate being here. Thanks for the kind words. I would just recommend people go to thehiresidechats.com. And then if they want to sign up for the extended shows, the HiresideChatsPlus.com, sure, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on YouTube, but who knows for how long. I think people should get back to right. going to the individual websites and 
let the curation be for other stuff. But I appreciate being here, guys. Thanks a lot. It definitely was fun. Good times. Thank you, Greg. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, Greg Carwoods. He is the host. Greg Carwood. He is the host of the Higher Side Chat. Thank you again so much, my friend. Peace and so much love, ladies and gentlemen. Stay tuned. There will always be more.